The Missing Persons Case of Amelia Earhart. The trailblazing aviator's disappearance remains a source of fascination and controversy. She never reached her 40th birthday, but in her brief life, Amelia Earhart became a record-breaking female aviator whose international fame improved public acceptance of aviation and paved the way for other women in commercial flight. Amelia Mary Earhart was born on July 24, 1897, in Atchison, Kansas, to Amy Otis Earhart and Edwin Stanton Earhart, followed in 1899 by her sister, Mariel. The family moved from Kansas to Iowa, to Minnesota, to Illinois, where Earhart graduated from high school. During World War I, she left college to work at a Canadian military hospital, where she met aviators and became intrigued with flying. After the war, Earhart completed a semester at Columbia University, then the University of Southern California. With her first plane ride in 1920, she realized her true passion and began flying lessons with female aviator Netta Snook. On her 25th birthday, Earhart purchased a Kenner Airster biplane. She flew it in 1922 when she set the women's altitude record of 14,000 feet. With faltering family finances, she soon sold the plane. When her parents divorced in 1924, Earhart moved with her mother and sister to Massachusetts and became a settlement worker at Denison House in Boston while also flying in air shows. Earhart's life changed dramatically in 1928 when publisher George Putnam, seeking to expand on public enthusiasm for Charles Lindbergh's transcontinental flight a year earlier, tapped Earhart to become the first woman to cross the Atlantic by plane. She succeeded, albeit as a passenger. But when the flight from Newfoundland landed in Wales on June 17, 1928, Earhart became a media sensation and symbol of what women could achieve. Putnam remained her promoter, publishing her two books, 20 Hours, 40 Minutes, in 1928, and The Fun of It, in 1932. Earhart married Putnam in 1931, though she retained her maiden name and considered the marriage an equal partnership. In 1930, after only 15 minutes of instruction, Earhart became the first woman to fly an autogyro, featuring rotating blades to increase lift and allow short takeoffs and landings. Earhart set the first autogyro altitude record and made two autogyro cross-country tours, which were marked by three public crashes. Though Earhart was the most famous woman pilot, she was not necessarily the most skilled. Earhart became the first woman vice president of the National Aeronautic Association, which authorized official records and races. She persuaded the organization to establish separate female records because women did not have the money or planes, thus the experience to fairly compete against men for world titles. Earhart lobbied Congress for aviation legislation she also lobbied for birth control rights, supported women in politics and business, and endorsed the draft for men, women, and even elderly to promote equality and peace. Earhart designed a line of functional women's clothing, including dresses, blouses, pants, suits, and hats, initially using her own sewing machine, dress form, and seamstress. She modeled her own designs for promotional spreads. Earhart also designed a line of lightweight, canvas-covered plywood luggage sold by Ornstein Trunk of Newark, New Jersey. Earhart luggage was sold into the 1990s. Earhart's popularity brought opportunities from a short-lived fashion business to a stint as aviation editor at Cosmopolitan. It also brought financing for subsequent record-breaking flights in speed and distance. In 1932, 
she became the first woman to fly solo across the Atlantic as a pilot. Her awards included the American Distinguished Flying Cross and the Cross of the French Legion of Honor. In 1929, Earhart helped found the 99s, an organization of female aviators. In 1935, Earhart became a visiting professor at Purdue University at the invitation of Purdue president, an advocate of higher education for women, especially in engineering and science. Earhart, a former pre-medical student, served as a counselor for women and a lecturer in aeronautics. Elliot was also interested in supporting Earhart's flying career and convinced Purdue benefactors to purchase her a twin-engine Lockheed 10E Electra. In 1935, Purdue University hired Earhart as aviation advisor and career counselor for women and purchased the Lockheed plane she dubbed her flying laboratory. On June 1, 1937, she left Miami with navigator Fred Noonan, seeking to become the first woman to fly around the world. With 7,000 miles remaining, the plane lost radio contact near the Howland Islands. On the morning of July 2, 1937, Amelia Earhart and her navigator, Fred Noonan, took off from Lai, New Guinea, on one of the last legs of their historic attempt to circumnavigate the globe. Their next destination was Howland Island in the central Pacific Ocean, some 2,500 miles away. A U.S. Coast Guard cutter, the Itasca, waited there to guide the world-famous aviator in for a landing on the tiny, uninhabited Coral Atoll. But Earhart never arrived on Howland Island. Battling overcast skies, faulty radio transmissions, and a rapidly diminishing fuel supply in her twin-engine Lockheed Electra plane, she and Noonan lost contact with the Itasca somewhere over the Pacific. Despite a search and rescue mission of unprecedented scale, including ships and planes from the U.S. Navy and Coast Guard, scouring some 250,000 square miles of ocean, they were never found. In its official report at the time, the Navy concluded that Earhart and Noonan had ran out of fuel, crashed into the Pacific, and drowned. A court order declared Earhart legally dead in January 1939, 18 months after she disappeared. From the beginning, however, debate has raged over what actually happened on July 2, 1937, and afterward. Several alternate theories have surfaced and many millions of dollars have been spent searching for evidence that would reveal the truth of Earhart's fate. First, the castaway theory. In her last radio transmission, made at 8.43 a.m. local time on the morning she disappeared, Earhart reported flying on the line 157-337, running north and south, a set of directional coordinates that described a line running through Howland Island. In 1989, an organization called the International Group for Historic Aircraft Recovery, TIGER, launched its first expedition to Nicomoro that is part of the Republic of Kiribati. TIGER and its director, Richard Gillespie, believed that Earhart and Noonan couldn't find Howland Island. They continued along the 157-337 line some 350 nautical miles and made an emergency landing on Nicomoro, then called Gardner Island. According to this theory, they lived for a period of time as castaways on the tiny uninhabited island and eventually died there. U.S. Navy planes flew over Gardner Island on July 9, 1937, a week after Earhart's disappearance, and saw no sign of Earhart, Noonan, or the plane. But they did report seeing signs of recent habitation though no one had lived on the atoll since 1892. In 1940, British officials retrieved a partial human skeleton from a remote part of Nicomoro. A physician subsequently measured the bones and concluded they came from a man. The bones themselves were later lost, but Tiger analyzed the measurements and claimed that in fact, they came from a woman of European ancestry, 
of about Earhart's height of 5'7 to 5'8. In 2018, a forensic analysis of the bone measurements conducted by anthropologists from the University of Tennessee in cooperation with Tiger showed that the bones have more similarity to Earhart than to 99% of individuals in a large reference sample, according to a university statement at the time. Taken prisoner by Japanese. A competing theory argues that when they failed to land on Howland Island, Earhart and Noonan were forced to land on the Japanese-held Marshall Islands. According to this theory, the Japanese captured Earhart and Noonan and took them to the island of Saipan, some 1,450 miles south of Tokyo, where they tortured them as presumed spies for the U.S. government. They later died in custody, possibly by execution. Since the 1960s, the Japanese capture theory has been fueled by accounts of islanders living at the time of an American lady pilot held in custody in Saipan, which they passed on to their friends and descendants. Some of the theory's advocates suggest that Earhart and Noonan were in fact U.S. spies, and their around-the-world mission was a cover-up for efforts to fly over and observe Japanese fortifications in the Pacific. At the time, more than four years before the Pearl Harbor attack, Japan was not yet the Americans' enemy in World War II. Some have suggested that Earhart didn't die on Saipan after her capture, but was released and repatriated back to the United States under an assumed name. Beginning in the 1970s, some proponents of this theory have argued that a New Jersey woman named Irene Bolum was in fact Earhart. Bolum herself vigorously denied these claims, calling them a poorly documented hoax, but they persisted even long after her death in 1982. The Lingering Mystery Since 1989, Tiger has made at least a dozen expeditions to Nicomoro, turning up artifacts ranging from pieces of metal, possibly airplane parts, to a broken jar of freckle cream, but no conclusive proof that Earhart's plane landed there. Amid ongoing controversy spanning more than 80 years of debate between researchers and historians, the crash and sink theory remains the most widely accepted explanation of Earhart's fate. But over three expeditions since 2002, the deep sea exploration company Nauticos has used sonar to scan the area off Howland Island, near where Earhart's last radio message came from, covering nearly 2,000 square nautical miles without finding a trace of the wreckage of the Electra. Until that wreckage, or some other definitive piece of evidence, is found, the mystery surrounding Amelia Earhart's final flight will likely endure. The newest theory? Coconut crabs. Tiger believes that coconut crabs may have had a role to play in the pilot's demise. The rest of the theory is as follows. Noonan eventually died, the plane floated off the reef, and Earhart was alone. At least, there were no other humans with her on the island. Three years later, 13 bones were found on the island that were thought to be part of Amelia Earhart's skeleton. Authorities sent the bones to Fiji for examination, but they got lost on the way. What happened to the rest of her bones? Tiger believes this is where the coconut crabs come in. When the bones were discovered, coconut crabs had scattered them around. The organization's theory says that the crabs likely consumed Earhart's body after she died and dragged her bones back to their burrows. To prove this theory, Tiger had to determine whether or not the crabs would bring the bones back to their burrows. As a test, they placed a pig carcass where they believed Earhart might have been, and waited. And just as they expected, the crabs, along with several other strawberry hermit crabs, swarmed the body. Within two weeks, the crabs had removed most of the flesh. A year later, they found the crabs had dragged some of the bones 60 feet. They could not, however, find all of the remains. In 2001, unearthed possible signs of an American castaway on the island including the remains of several campfires, items such as a jackknife, a woman's compact, a zipper pull, 
and glass jars. In 2017, Tiger brought four forensic dogs to the site, who signaled that they had found a spot where someone had died. They didn't find the bones then, but they're still hoping. The organization is still optimistic that they'll find the source of the scent that alerted the dogs, and eventually they'll find the spot where the coconut crabs carried Earhart's remains all those years ago. Thanks so much for watching my video. Be sure to subscribe, come hang out with me, and hear more missing persons cases. Here's another video to check out in case you missed it, and here's a playlist of all my videos.